Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. In our previous lectures, we talked about the diplomacy of the late 1930s, and in particular the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, which fully launched the American war effort into World War II. In the lectures to come, we'll talk about that war effort, and in particular in this series of lectures, the effort on the American home front during the war, starting with this lecture about mobilizing for war. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor had a number of immediate effects. First of all, as I described in the previous lecture, it was a surprise attack that had devastating effects on Pearl Harbor itself and on the American Pacific Fleet in particular. It did set back the American war effort in the Pacific in a large degree. However, many scholars have noted that in the longer term, the attack at Pearl Harbor may have hurt Japan more than it hurt the United States, because in effect it awakened the sleeping giant. The United States was now fully unified behind a war effort that, as I described in previous lectures, had been a pretty divisive issue on the home front. It also led to immediate fears of Japanese immigrants and Japanese Americans, particularly on the American West Coast, an issue that we're going to discuss in a future lecture. In broad terms, over these next several lectures as we go through World War II, we'll talk about three fronts in particular. The combat fronts of the European and Pacific Front, but starting with the American home front. Now, one of the top priorities after the attack at Pearl Harbor was, of course, building an army. And this proved to be a challenge for a number of different reasons. The United States implemented a comprehensive draft males between the age of 18 and 38 had to register for the draft, and many of them ended up serving in the war. There was a large degree of volunteerism. As you might imagine, the attack at Pearl Harbor inspired millions of Americans to voluntarily join the war effort. There were about 6.3 million volunteers. All told, between the draft and volunteers, there were nearly 18 million men who were examined for induction into the American military. About 6.5 million of those were rejected as unfit. And this, in some ways, will be the final footnote to our discussions about the Great Depression and the long-term impact that the Depression had on America's fitness and health. Many of those who were rejected were stricken with some kind of ailment or disease, weak bones, poor vision, flat feet, etc., the kind of things that creeping malnutrition would have uh, created in some cases. Still, there were about 11.5 million who ultimately joined the armed forces during the war. The average length of service during the war was about 33 months. Of that, roughly half, about 16 months, was spent serving abroad on average. In terms of mortality, about 0.86% of those who went into the military were killed in action, and 0.3% died from other causes. Another 1.7% were wounded during the war. So your casualty rate during World War II for American servicemen was about 3%. We'll talk about combat conditions and the experience of those soldiers later in these lectures. For now, when we think about the American home front, it became an all-hands-on-deck process. There was a high degree of enthusiasm and support for the war on the home front, which really lasted for the duration of the war. There is always some protest. There are always uh, some Americans who don't support the war. But during World War II, more than almost any war in America's recent history, there was a high level of support for the war. And we see this comprehensive work effort on the home front. So if we think about those men ages 18 to 38, a high percentage of them going into the armed forces and many of them being sent abroad, the work effort on the home front involved just about everybody else. So young boys, younger than 18, and those older than 38 or 40 years old, 
um, picked up the war effort on the home front. Many of those young boys going into factories or picking crops in the countryside. Farmers moved from the countryside into the cities to participate in the war industries. Women worked in many of the munitions uh, factories, and we'll talk about their experience in future lectures. Similarly, African Americans um, participate in a large measure. This is kind of a, a final footnote in the Great Migration, as more African Americans continue to leave the sharecrop farms of the South and moving into the cities of the Midwest and the North. In the countryside, we see uh, a massive expansion of immigration of Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and others who begin to pick up uh, the shortage of workers on those farms in the American countryside. In particular, for Mexican immigrants, we see a reversal of the conditions of the Great Depression. When we talked about hundreds of thousands of Mexicans being deported during the Great Depression, well, during World War II, those conditions were reversed as there was a severe labor shortage, particularly on the West Coast. Uh, Japanese Americans, many of whom worked in agricultural industries, uh, were interned, which we'll talk about in a future lecture, which left few available to work uh, in the agricultural industry. So the United States government negotiated the Bracero program with Mexico. Under this program, Mexican laborers were encouraged to migrate into the United States, and the government guaranteed them minimum wages and certain living and working conditions. Certainly, conditions for those workers were far from perfect, and there were some incidents that we'll talk about in future lectures. Nonetheless, by virtue of this Bracero program, about 200,000 Mexicans immigrated into the United States, many of them returning after having been sent back to Mexico during the Great Depression. It was this massive effort at production that ultimately brought an end to the Great Depression, more than the New Deal, which we talked about in previous lectures. The problem now during the war was not unemployment. It was finding enough people to do the work needed. Just about anyone could get a job during the war years. As FDR himself described it, he had given up being Dr. New Deal in order to become Dr. Win the War. Let's talk about just a few measures of the productivity that brings an end to the Depression. During the war years, the federal budget grew from about $9 billion in 1939 to more than $100 billion in 1945, so uh, multiplied more than tenfold. By 1945, the United States was turning out roughly half of all of the available production goods in the world. This staggering production becomes almost difficult to comprehend. During the war years, the United States produced roughly 275,000 airplanes and 88,000 tanks. Think about the capacity of one of the large football stadiums in our country. Uh, about 85,000 or so. So you're talking about a stadium filled with tanks and four times over that number in terms of airplanes. We also built some 3,000 ships. So if you think about the number of ships sunk or damaged in Pearl Harbor, we're talking about maybe 30. We produce 100 times that fold over the course of the war. Now, not all of those are battleships or aircraft carriers like those at Pearl Harbor but many of them were. By 1945, a new ship was being launched on average every 24 hours. This process of mobilizing for the war and wartime production went far beyond just government efforts. Everyone in the country was involved in one way or another in this war effort, and it impacted everyone's life at home. It was American citizens who financed the war. And when you think about having to pay for a massive undertaking, like a war, there are a few ways that this is done, one of which might be to raise income taxes, which was done during the war years to some extent. But the other is the sale of war bonds. And if we think about bonds in particular in this way, it's actually a loan from an American citizen to the government. 
you are lending the government money and then a few years down the road you're going to get that money back with interest and so american citizens by the millions voluntarily willingly loaned money to the government to help keep us involved in the war effort there was a massive publicity campaign behind this an advertising campaign you see the poster on the screen there were many many different ones like this back him up buy war bonds kind of drawing connections between the average citizen and the soldier who was fighting abroad and there's a healthy degree of guilt involved in this campaign as well we'll, we'll look at a few other posters on some future slides but the idea is if you as an average citizen aren't doing your part you're going to be letting down a soldier in the field a soldier who might ultimately be wounded or killed because of your lack of participation in the process over the course of the war due in part to this massive advertising campaign Americans bought about hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of war bonds and as I noted above the entire federal budget in 1945 was about a hundred billion so you're talking about several years worth of the entire federal budget including the war effort paid for by the purchase of war bonds also during the war years private industries switched over to wartime production a process that was overseen by the war production board this group would inform private industries what was needed of them the automotive industry for instance was all but terminated in 1942 as automotive plants were switched over to making war supplies jeeps tanks and so on so on the home front if you wanted to purchase a car in 1943 or 44 more than likely you were going to have to buy a used car the clothing industry as well was switched over to the production of uniforms and helmets and socks and boots to supply the soldiers so imagine going into a clothing store in 1944 or 45 and seeing hardly any clothes available on the rack the clothing industry uh, like the automotive industry and so many others was almost shut down for private consumption during the war years with that in mind almost everything on the home front was rationed one wartime motto was use it up wear it out make it do or do without it was rare during the war years to purchase anything new Americans used old stuff collected old scrap metal donated rubber tires to the cause and of course grew victory gardens on the home front to conserve food that otherwise had to be sent to the soldiers fighting abroad items like coffee butter gas shoes chocolate and many others were all rationed Americans would get a monthly ration book uh, in the mail filled with coupons that they could use to go down to the store and get meat or butter or milk and once the coupons were gone they were gone you just had to live without we see some aspects of that uh, in the posters on this page is your trip necessary needless travel interferes with the war effort have you really tried to save gas by getting into a car club and so there were many of these posters that were dedicated to conserving gas uh, going without travel and so on but one of the items that was even more scarce and hard to get than gas was rubber if you think about many of the world sources of rubber they come from Southeast Asia where Japan was dominant and so one of the effects of trying to conserve gas was really more pointed in a kind of sneaky way at conserving tires and rubber because they were very difficult for Americans to come by during the war also early in the war Americans in coastal cities particularly along the Atlantic seaboard underwent blackouts as cities like Jacksonville Florida Charleston South Carolina and many others were forced to go completely dark at night this was because Japanese uh, and German submarines were at times so close to the coast that they could have seen those coastal targets um, particularly German u-boats on the East Coast for at times during the war were right there along the coast 
Another item that was rationed was paper. Many of the chemicals involved in producing paper were in short supply during the war. And so things like newspapers and magazines at times had to cut the number of pages or the frequency of their circulation because the paper itself was in short supply. As we'll see, this process was advertised and pushed by a number of Hollywood stars, athletes, and others. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about some of the ways that the war impacted popular culture and some of the ways that those involved in culture affected the war effort on the home front.